we welcome all of you uh, on this uh, NXP Campus Connect session. So I will just give you a brief background of this. Uh, during COVID time, you know, we started this digital channel where we can share new technologies with the college uh, students and uh, the new uh, graduates who joined us in last, you know, two to three years, they are also uh, joining us in big numbers. This program is continuously running for last three years and every first and third Tuesday we are delivering uh, sessions uh, on first Tuesday. We are delivering VLSI related topics and on third Tuesday every month we are relating. Uh, we are delivering uh, system engineering related topic and today is the third Tuesday and uh, that's what we have uh, embedded system design and enablement uh, session today. We have, you know, uh, Sarat, uh, who is our, uh, you know, uh, uh, site lead for Hyderabad. Hyderabad is pioneer in, you know, uh, delivering communication 5G related enablement infrastructure and the software. Uh, Sarat, uh, you know, we have today, this session is, you know, hosted by Chitkara University. So uh, over to you, Sarat, to share few, you know, uh, uh, commitment from NXP India leadership team. Yes. Thank you, Manish, and uh, thank you, uh, everybody at Chitkara University and all those who have dialed into this meeting. Uh, I'm Dr. Sarath Vecha. As uh, Manish mentioned, I lead uh, Hyderabad site. As far as my functional responsibility is concerned, I lead the 5G and networking solutions for the business line called uh, Secure Connected Edge. This is one of the uh, largest business lines in, uh, in NXP. Uh, for those who have not uh, heard about NXP or who have not joined some of the uh, NXP Campus Connect meetings that we have been conducting over the last couple of years, uh, NXP is a semiconductor major. And uh, unlike uh, some of the other companies who work on the general purpose computing, NXP mainly focuses on um, microprocessor units and microcontrollers that are uh, deployed widely in non-general purpose computing world. The main uh, example I can give you which you can easily relate to is automotive. Automotive once upon a time used to be a lot of mechanical stuff and very little electronics. But as time passed by, it's more electronics and less of mechanical nowadays as far as the advancements are concerned. You might be hearing about, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know, infotainment systems that are coming within the car and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, autonomous driving that is happening in the, in the cars. So even in India now, we are getting different levels of ADA, uh, you know, ranging from, uh, you know, automatic sensing of the vehicles around, applying brakes automatically, or, uh, you know, uh, lane navigation, all that stuff that is already available in India. So that is one, one main example I can give you. Apart from the automotive, we have uh, the secure connected edge where the billions of uh, IoT, industrial and communication devices that are deployed around the world that establish smart communication. So uh, it, it, all these things together make a smart world possible through NXP uh, semiconductor devices. The one other thing I would like to mention is that uh, though people uh, see NXP as, as a semiconductor company and hence more hardware driven, we have a large number of software professionals in NXP who have been uh, you know, enjoying their work and uh, all the technologies that they have been contributing to within NXP. NXP is hardware plus software together and as uh, in the recent past, it's happening. It is software which is driving more of the hardware decisions also. So those uh, all the students and faculty who have dialed in have to look at NXP not only as a semiconductor company, but also a potential uh, technology company which can provide very good opportunities for the software professionals also. With that introduction, I would again uh, hand it back to Manish uh, to initiate this particular session of uh, uh, NXP Campus Connect, which has been successfully running over the last couple of years. Our endeavor as part of this program is to get as much knowledge as possible 
to our uh, university partners so that students when they actually complete their uh, you know a course in the university they are not unfamiliar with uh, with uh, you know embedded systems semiconductors vlsi and uh, you know the applications that we are actually driving and our endeavor is mainly to make uh, better professionals uh, from coming out of the college so i hope we have been contributing to that over the last couple of years and uh, manish is driving that successfully and over to you manish now for introducing this particular session thank you very much thank you sarath ji for this you know uh, motivation and uh, commitment from uh, nxp india leadership team and hitesh garg who is our country head he is you know very committed and i think well connected to the chitkara university chitkara university is very close to him and uh, he requested me to you know uh, host a session here and i think today uh, we have uh, uh, hosted this session and thank you ma'am for all your support your college is very important uh, for us also and uh, last year uh, you know i hired lot of guys uh, from this university and i think six plus guys are in my team itself so uh, thank you for all that support and uh, yes nxp is very committed and this is also you know one of our commitment that we are going to train uh, students in the college so that you know from day one those guys will be those students will be very very useful for us over to you ma'am maybe a few words from your side thank you thanks a lot for your all support over to you ma'am thank you so much thank you so much to the entire team of nxp and a very good evening to all who are present here as well as to all who are there in the online session so you know industry academy are connect these are the three words we have been listening so much you know and in every academic and institute we'll find these words but the success stories will be very limited so today i'm here to talk about one such story of exciting journey of the chitkara students to semiconductor industry particularly in relation of remarkable partnership between chitkara university and nxp semiconductor india over the past decades it's almost 10 years now this collaboration has flourished under the dynamic leadership and tireless efforts of mr hitesh kark now the country head of nxp india together we have laid the foundation for a transformative journey that has propelled both academia and industry towards a new horizon we all understand that the semiconductors are the building block of modern technology powering an array of devices that have become the integral part of our lives you know from smartphone and laptops to the autonomous vehicles and smart appliances semiconductors are the heart of these technological marvels and as we move into future the demand for faster smaller and more efficient semiconductor will continue to surge presenting immense opportunities and challenges altogether well about the association of chitkara university and nxp semiconductor bangalore has been instrumental in fostering innovation research and development in the semiconductor domain the partnership has enabled students and the faculty to gain hands on experience with cutting edge technologies thus bridging the gap between those theoretical knowledge and practical application you know through those internships collaborative projects and joint research initiatives the students have been exposed to the real world scenarios and this equipped them with some invaluable skills and enhancing their employability well under the guidance of mr hitesh karg and his entire team you know nxp has been extending its support to chitkara university by sharing their industry insights organizing workshops providing mentorship to the students and this holistic approach has empowered these aspiring engineers as well as the researchers to explore their potential pushing the boundaries of the semiconductor technology well the impact of this association is reflected in numerous success stories of chitkara alumni who have gone to become now like the innovators in the semiconductor industry uh looking ahead if i talk about you know of semiconductor uh, uh, industry this appears to be more brighter than ever before as emerging technologies such as ai 
IoT, that is Internet of Things, everybody talks about 5G. These have revolutionized various sectors. The demand for semiconductor uh, companies will skyrocket, we all understand. The collaboration between the Chatkara University and NXP will continue to play a pivotal role in shaping the future by nurturing talent, fostering innovation, and driving research breakthroughs. Moreover, the association's impact extends beyond academia. It is not just that, you know, those teaching learning scenarios. Through corporate social responsibility initiatives and uh, community engagements, you know, Chitkara University and NXP India has made significant contribution to society. Everybody might be thinking of how that is happening, you know. So NXP and its entire team, they are leveraging their expertise and resources and, you know, they have improved the access to quality education, prompted sustainability, and uplifted the lives of countless students. This commitment to social welfare exemplifies the values of both the institutions, and they really serve as beacon of inspiration for the entire semiconductor community. Well, in conclusion, the future of semiconductor holds immense potential and the association between Chitkara University and NXP Semiconductor under the visionary leadership of Mr. Hitesh Kark has been at the forefront of driving this transformation. As we witness technological advancements unfolds at an unprecedented pace, it is the synergy between the academia and the industry that will pave the way for innovation and progress. And, you know, I'm pretty much confident about it. And so is our leadership team, you know, that this partnership will continue to thrive, shaping the next generation of semiconductor professionals and propelling India's position in the global technology landscape. Thank you so much to the entire team of NXP. Thanks a lot, ma'am, for these inspirational words and the motivation for all of us. Yes, we have to take this collaboration to the next level. And yes, you rightly said Hiteshkar is a very, you know, young and a dynamic leader. And under his, you know, uh, guidance, this whole management team of NXP India is very dedicated and, you know, supportive for all these initiatives. With this, once again, thanks a lot for giving us this opportunity. And Thank I, you. I am requesting, you know, join all our sessions. It will be very, very useful for students. And yes, uh, we are going to increase our collaborations in the future. For sure. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Once again, now we are going to start today's session. Uh, Nishant Omar is the presenter today. Uh, a brief introduction of Nishant is he is having 20 plus years of industry experience and our experts on embedded system design and development and his focus mainly on the firmware engineering. So he is going to share his thought on uh, how we can design a quality embedded system and what all we have to consider, how we are going to, you know, complete enablement end to end for embedded systems. Over to you, Nishan. Uh, thanks, Manish. Um, hello, all. Good evening. So today we'll be talking about embedded system design and enable enablement. Uh, I'll share my agenda for the day. So we'll be talking about what are embedded systems. We're talking about components in embedded systems. Guys, I think my screen is visible, right? Can somebody confirm yes, on that? Yes, yes, Nishant. Go ahead. Great. Thanks, Manish. So we'll be talking what is embedded system? What are the different components of embedded systems? Different categories in which we can divide an embedded system. As uh, Sarat was talking about, it's a software hardware combination. How it is a software hardware? What is the development process? We'll talk about that. For the guys in college, microprocessor versus microcontroller, very hot topic. They want to discuss about this. We'll talk about it. Then we will also learn about the steps. If you want to define an embedded system, what could be an ideal workflow to define it out? And then we will see some examples how an embedded system uh, was developed and how it looks like. And in the end, we will have a question and answer session. So guys, what is an embedded system? This is really a tough question. No single answer is available today. Everything we see around is embedded. So how do we define it? Now we say an embedded system is an electronic or an electromechanical system designed to perform 
any specific function and it is in combination of both hardware and software so as sarath was talking about right nxp is a semiconductor industry but it has both an hardware and a software component so this is where we build an embedded system not with hardware not with software but with both combinations in some cases embedded systems are actually a smaller module or parts of a bigger product we can take an example of abs which is anti lock braking system in a car so there is one of one embedded system called abs which is part of a bigger system a car it's an example and you understood it correctly it's an hardware but we cannot say it's a general purpose computer it's not a computer it's a dedicated solution so we can say embedded is actually dedicated meant to do a specific job it takes an advantage of an application and the hardware design to perform a specific job in the best optimized manner let's see what are the few examples of embedded system so today whatever you see around you is actually an embedded system be it a smart wa a smart watch a camera a fax machine or a printer mobile phones video games infotainment in cars your post machine where you swipe your card and get your payment done your set top boxes your smart smart streaming devices or even your uh, smaller modules or subsystem in car world around you is filled with different kind of embedded system if you just try to evaluate that system you will figure it out it is performing a specific job so let's see how to make an embedded system what are the different components of that now embedded system as we talked about it is hardware plus software so there is one more component where we call as embedded ics or integrated circuits so these are the founding blocks of any embedded solution or a system in ics when we say we have your processing unit so generally we learn a computer we see input output and processing unit so this is the same processing unit which performs the processing of our data now this could be a microcontroller or a microprocessor or a digital signal processor we will talk about these component in further slides what they perform and why are they different then we have an ics which are very important component which we call as memory memories are the areas where you store the data or analyze it for the runtime evaluation then we have an embedded hardware as a second component where you have your input output devices input devices could be like your sensors your push button your communication signals which come as an input to the system which can be analyzed and then you have an output devices like your displays actuators where the analyzed output performs a specific job so this is a generic term input processing and an output in an embedded system input and output becomes an hardware components which takes an input generates an output and then we have a software component now so software component device drivers operating system the stacks which performs a specific uh, application layer jobs and a runtime application software in a further slide you will see how this different embedded software hardware and ics are stacked together to prepare an embedded system so now if you see there will be an embedded hardware there will be different components and ics over there your processing unit your memory your input devices sensors and your output devices which are actuators apart from that there would be an application supporting circuitry power communication as well as communication interface this prepares your hardware now hardware without any information how to perform is not not going to do the job so in order to make your hardware perform a specific job you do an embedded software this is your runtime application which you develop and deploy it on your cpu or a processing unit and get your work done by your embedded hardware so you see hardware ics and software together gives you an embedded solution now this is kind of an uh, actual application board which can be a part of a bigger system with a executable running on it when i say executable it's a piece of software which is performing a specific job so let's see what is a block diagram of a typical embedded system as i said on a higher level you have an input you have an output and you have a processing unit 
So you can see over here, there are the sensors, different kind of sensors you can see, which goes to an input. Now sensors could be analog input or it could be digital. So if it's an analog, it, it's go to A to D conversion, analog to digital conversion, and then it goes as a digital signal to your processing unit. Now processing unit is taking an in, uh, information from all the supported uh, ecosystem and then performs an analysis of the input data coming to it and takes an action. Now action is a digital output from your CPU, gets converted into an actionable item or an analog signal if required, and then drives your actuator. Actuators then perform a control of an operation on an external device. You have your CPU and a software interacting together with the memory, and then you have a human interface or a HMI we call it, human machine interface, where you can visually analyze the data and the operations of your embedded system. So what are the major component or jobs we are performing? We are doing a data acquisition, the input. We are handling the communication, which is an interface to the external world for this embedded system, like your USB interface, your UART or serial port interfaces. Then we have a system logic and control algorithm, which is your runtime software, which is deployed on your CPU. Then we have an auxiliary system, your power control unit, which is monitoring the powering and the power consumption of your board. Displays, which is human machine interface or uh, uh, your display area. Storage for the memory for volatile and non-volatile memories. And then there is the monitoring and protection and test and diagnosis to debug your runtime environments. So let's see how an embedded application journey starts. As we saw, the very first component would be a semiconductor device. So there is a uh, NXP, a semiconductor company. They are design, uh, defining and designing a chip or a semiconductor. We take multiple semiconductors and we make an electronic circuit out of it. These electronic circuits together are binded to prepare a logical module which can perform some specific job when asked to do so. Now, logical modules are actually binded together to prepare your embedded system. Now, this is your complete solution with different uh, logical modules and programmed with the software to perform a job. Now, this embedded system can be a smaller unit or a component in an end application. For example, in your car, there is something which is called as ECU, electronic control unit. There could be multiple ECUs in your car. And this could be one ECU, which is actually a single embedded solution. So you can see the journey from the semiconductor design to an end product, how uh, your uh, different components and modules are built together. Now let's look into the categories of embedded system. What are the different categories over there? So based on the behavior and the usage of your embedded system, uh, the embedded categories are divided into four types. There are real-time systems, standalone embedded systems, networked embedded systems, and mobile embedded systems. We'll look into those. So real-time system, what is it? Real-time means which is happening in front of you, giving you a feel that it was taking an input now itself and performing an operation immediately. Embedded system in which a specific application task is to be completed in a specified duration. So you expect the system to perform the stipulated operations in a defined time period. Systems working with a strict time constraints and providing you the worst case time estimates in critical situations lie under this category. How do we prepare a real time system? So you have an embedded system. You add a real time computing. And in order to add a real time computing, RTOS are the mediums through which we add a real time computing to it. And then the output, what is where we, we prepare, is called a real time embedded system. So, general system, what you are making, what we have discussed till now, add a real time RTOS operations on that, and you get a real time embedded system on it. Now, RTOS, it could be a new term for a few people, it could be a known term. Let's talk about it a bit. RTOS is real-time operating system. Real-time computing is represented by a dedicated type of operating system is what we call as RTOS. 
What are the specific characteristics of an RTOS? So here are the few bullet items which actually tells your RTOS behavior. Determinism. Repeating an input will result the same kind of an out output in an RTOS. So RTOS could be a, a, a box for you. And if you give a same kind of an input in a same environment, it will perform the same job in same duration in same manner for you. It is high performance. It is fast and responsive and execute your actions within a small fraction of time. Fraction of time is which is actually predefined or is the, uh, within a defined duration. Safety and security is another characteristics of an RTOS. These are used in a critical scenarios where a system failure could cause a catastrophic consequences. For example, your robotics, your flight controllers. If they fail, it can cost you a life. So under these scenarios, we want a reliable solution which is safe and secure. And with an operating system which is reliable, we can achieve that part in our embedded solutions. Priority based scheduling. So in RTOS, you create a different uh, level of operations and you can define which operation can perform which task in which order, which is called as priority based scheduling. And the size is to be smaller. We are not talking operating system which are running in your PC and computers. We are talking about we are talking about the operating system which runs in your embedded controllers where we know that the memory is not pretty huge. So the size footprint of this operating system which are our, our TOS, should be very small. And today we have n number of our TOS, which lie in the embedded category and are smaller footprint sizes. So let's see how our software can be built with an RTOS. How we can achieve the characteristics what we were talking earlier. So software should detect critical events, which we call as interrupts in a deterministically fashion or a defined way in a defined period of time. This is one requirement. Second is software should schedule the event handler, the, the behavior of the task what you want to perform. Software should be allowed to do this job in a defined time manner. And you want your execution should be done without any disturbances within a time frame of X microsecond. These are some your design guidelines which you want to achieve when you are making a development with an operating system. So when we have an operating system, how do we achieve this? So first thing is we should detect the critical events. So we have to make sure that we write our IRQs, interrupt service routines or inter interrupt request queues. This should not be huge because whenever an interrupt happens, your normal course of operation is interrupted as it, and is not performed. If you spent lot of time in your IRQs, you will not allow other critical events to happen and even you will disrupt the deterministic way of your uh, firmware or your uh, software. So you have to write your IRQs which performs a smaller operations and exit and then gives a handle to your operating system. Then you have a priority based scheduling operation in OS. You can have your multiple sub tasks or sub operations defined in your solution and you can define in which order which particular task will execute and you even get an option to interrupt a lower priority operation with a higher priority operation when you use an operating system. So you can design your solution in a way you want it to work when multiple action items are available at the same time. Operating system gives you that liberty. And then how do you ensure that your task is done without any disturbance? So you have an, a task execution order and a priority mechanism which will tell you that your highest critical priority job should execute in all scenarios even if there are multiple operations. So customer can define their own flow of your application based on their own requirements and can subdivide in different modules or submodules. So operating system plays the most important role in real time system. It allows you all the liberty to make smaller modules of your solution and arrange them in the order you want to call or execute them. Few example of RTOS which are available today. Free RTOS, very known term in the open market. Zephyr, Linux with an RT patch, 
and then we also have commercial RTOS like VxWorks. All these are embedded RTOS which we can deploy in our smaller footprint controllers and achieve all the scheduling and uh, timing uh, activities of an operating system. <clears throat> now we look into the types of real system, real time system. We have two categories over there: hard real time systems and soft real time systems. The hard real time systems are system which make sure that all the critical processes are completed within a given time frame. So the scope of missing the timeline is is not allowed in your hard real time system. This is how we can de uh, define that. It means these are the system which prioritize your deadlines rather than your optimizations or performance. If there is a trade off to be taken that your timing should be followed or your performance should be adhered. Hard real time system will follow the timing guidelines rather than your performance guidelines. <coughs> so examples could be your military operations. You cannot allow your firing a missile and you cannot allow a delay in that. Okay, it can be triggered after three seconds of your button press. Your target will be gone a way, way ahead. Your automobiles, you cannot expect you are applying a brake and it will take three seconds before responding. No. There will be a collision. There could be an accident. Your uh, transport mediums, wherever ships, railways, airplanes, wherever you are taking and talking about a uh, uh, what you call lives or your actions which can result into a catastrophic uh, problem because of delay will lie in the category of hard real time. Soft real time systems. OK, timing is to be followed, but they do allow that if you miss the timeline, the impacts are very minimal. It can be missed uh, at times. That should not be a routine that you keep on missing your timelines because your experience with that system will deteriorate. But even if it misses a time or delays by a by a few um, say a few seconds or microseconds, it will not impact the user usability. Examples are your smart TV. You press your button, it takes a fraction of seconds more to turn on. Not a problem. We can cope up with that. Your DVD player, your music system, you're hitting a button to play our next song. It takes a fraction more acceptable, not causing any issues. But if it keep on doing it, it will give you an annoying experience. So the systems again follow a timeline with not very stringent boundaries comes under the soft real time system category. Now the second category of embedded system was the standalone systems. These are the system which can perform the controlling of your input and output in an isolated mode. These are self dependent, self sufficient systems. They do not require any host system to host them and get and uh, guide them how to perform. No, all the decision making power is with the system itself. Input coming from input ports could be analog and digital. They should be able to handle it out. System will perform the analysis of the input, control the actuators which are directly connected to the output ports and give you a user experience directly. Examples, digital camera, microwaves, your air conditioning. You give you an input, it will do your job and will give you an output in front of you immediately. So these are standalone, not uh, relying upon any further uh, subsystems to perform the job or any other embedded system to perform the job. Third category of uh, embedded system we talked about was a network system. Now these are the systems which are having network interfaces and they have the shared resources for the input and output over the network. So there could be multiple embedded system which are connected over a networked uh, platform and they could be sharing multiple kind of inputs from each other or a standalone input output sources and can perform their job and give their output to other network system on the same subsystem. Example could be a LAN and WAN or even internet. So example is your home Wi-Fi network, security camera network. So everything is connected over a network. Your camera is detecting some intrusion. It goes to the central console unit. It takes an action and triggers an alarm on an output, which is could be a, uh, your phone calling upon your phone or it could be locking your go, a gate itself. So these are taking an input from another subsystem, analyzing in a central area and controlling another subsystem on the same network. 
this becomes your uh, combination of your network system and multiple embedded solutions are part of it. And the last uh, embedded category was a mobile embedded system. This, this is a generic term given to the portable embedded system like cell phone, mobile, digital cameras, which you can hold in your hands or are portable to be carried around. The only limitation we see in this area is that are limited in resources, means they can perform a predefined specific jobs and limited in the memory which they can hold. Then we'll talk about the embedded system development process. If you have to define an embedded system, how we should start, how we should analyze, okay, how to make it out. Let's talk about some steps over there. So anybody can make an embedded system. Any idea can be an embedded system. So how an embedded system development starts, it starts with an idea. You think about something you want to see to happen, or maybe you are thinking about a solution which you think can do the job, specific job for you. That is an idea which comes to you. Once an idea comes to you, you try to do a market survey or a customer survey just to tell you how adaptable or how value added uh, your idea could be. There we perform a voice of customer, VOC we call it, voice of customer. We try to pitch in our idea, not in terms of an embedded hardware or software, in terms of its features. And we discuss with the market people or customers and get their input. This will help you to define your idea into a form which can be uh, built as an embedded solution and will be accepted by the market. Once you have a voice of customer, you revise your idea, try to prepare it in a format where you can put your requirements of your embedded system. That I want to build this kind of an embedded system which will do this kind of an activity that will become a part of your requirement gathering. And as outcome of your requirement gathering, you will be preparing an RS, we call it requirement specification, which will be uh, an input to the people who want to implement that to prepare an embedded solution. Once you have a requirement, you have to prepare your architectural design, which will take requirement as an input and try to lay down your complete design of your embedded system on a higher level how your embedded system will look like, how different modules of your embedded system will interact with each other, how your uh, system will coexist in an environment where you have multiple uh, embedded system. All this thing will be covered up in your architecture definition. Once you have your higher level design available, then you do a proof of concept or a prototyping. Just to see the thing you were thinking will work. Now you have your higher level design, you try to build uh, by making smaller modules or some, some critical prototyping to see your idea is feasible or not. This covers the feasibility aspect of your end solution. Once prototyping is done and you have proven that the solution can be realized and you have mitigated all your high level risk which you, you were thinking might not work, then we go to the testing and the validation phase of it where we try to test and validate our prototype with some alpha customers or the people who might want to see the module behaviors. That will give you a confidence that the end solution is going to work in a required environment. Then we take it to the field testing for the alpha customers. Alpha customers are nothing, your first level evaluators of your solution to make sure that whatever you are proposing is actually usable and workable in the field environments. Once you have an input of the alpha customer testing, then you understand that your uh, concept is clean. You know how to build it out. And you know that your critical blocks are validated and qualified. You start preparing your end design. Then you prepare your final design of your product. After you have your design available, you prepare the detailed implementational blocks of your design. How you are going to write the code of your different modules. How are you going to integrate the different module code into a single entity? How are you going to optimize your performance of the power? All the, sorry, all those parts are covered in your detailed design definition. Then you define your test specification. When you have a design available, you know 
you have to test it out once your product is available after your development and you want to link all of your design to specific testing criteria to make sure it works with your marketing inputs so this will cover up the customer requirements whatever you have covered in your voc this will cover up your functional requirements what you have covered up in your design finalization and this will also cover up your non functional requirements which we call as nfrs these are the requirements which are not impacting the functionality but which impacts the usability of your product so you define those to make sure your product is complete and you have a mapping of covering all your development modules once you have this information ready you start the development of your module now here you will be preparing your hardware you will be writing your piece of code you will be testing your piece of code on your eval platforms you will be testing your piece of code on your end product and then you will be performing your unit level testing unit testing is testing of your smaller modules which you are writing independently and making sure they are functional in the required environment so unit testing is not your solution testing this is a testing of your uh, modules independently so unit testing we do on a module level and then we do smaller unit testing uh, which is a second one on integrating different modules together where we have an interdependency one is a single module testing other one is your integrated module testing in some defined environment once we see our modules are integrable and are working in standalone we do the integration testing where we pull in all the different units and modules which was developed in a development phase integrate it together in software and hardware and then perform the complete end to end testing of the different modules integrated together and then we after that we perform the final level of system testing system testing is testing your embedded solution or a, uh, a product in an environment where it will be interacting with external entities and see it is performing or behaving in an expected manner all this testing is performed in an environment where the development was done or within the boundaries of the development area once your product you identify has passed all the testing criteria we take it outside the development building or the area where the this ideation came into concept then we take it to the customers we have beta customers which could be uh, where we have to partner with some of the external marketing um, leaders or the players who can evaluate our platform and will be intended to use it in their environment to see whether our product is behaving as expected or not this expectation of beta customer is what we have taken during our voc voice of customer they will evaluate it against that and once we have an input from the customer yes this is kind of a field trial field trial has passed it is working as expected by the customer it is working in the environment where customer wants to see it we go to the production phase production is nothing but a mass market now we are producing and launching this product to the market so whatever we produce as an idea is qualified tested evaluated verified and is ready to be launched as a product in the market this is a typical development cycle of any embedded solutions which you want to develop now uh, i'm just talking going to talk a bit about traceability and uh, how do we ensure that we are developing it in a right way and right fashion in order to make sure that we are actually following the complete development cycle in the right way we try to maintain a traceability of every phase of your uh, gathering of data designing of data implementation and testing of the data so whenever we gather a requirement requirement defines how your system should work we should have a system system testing which is mapped to it to ensure that our product was built for a reason and it is performing the same reason or fulfilling the same requirements so we need to have a requirement and a matching system testing test cases there should be a traceability for this purpose then we define an architecture where we define different modules and we define the way how different modules will be integrated or joined together to produce a solution 
Then when we are doing an integration testing, we need to make sure the different modules and their integration design, which was produced in architecture or uh, architecture specification, is actually having a integration testing done for that scenario to cover up all the module scenarios of integration. And then we have a detailed design where we are developing independent modules. This will be covered up with a traceability of unit testing. So we ensure that we, when we build the smallest module of our design, we it is tested for its functionality in unit testing, and we show it via our uh, mapping. So wherever you have gathered your information or design the way it should work, it should be mapped to our respective testing modules, be it a feature testing, be it an integration of module testing, be it a system environmental testing for the end requirements. And we do maintain this kind of a traceability in embedded development workflow. So traceability process, what are the scope? Scope is covering everything. The same traceability works when you are defining a silicon, when you are making a microcontroller or any IC, you should, you should design, you should have a requirement for that design, you should have an A architecture for that design, you should have your, um, uh, what you call, development for that design. And accordingly, you should have your unit testing, system testing, and integration testing. Silicon is in the same scope. Same is applicable for your software when you do a develop. You have to develop your software in modules, which will do the job. So you should have unit test cases which are evaluating your software modules. You should have integration test cases which are evaluating the functionality of integrated modules. And you should have a system level or a use case level uh, testing for your software. I'm just showing a typical stack format of your software. You have your microcontroller where you have a boot ROM. Boot ROM is a component which enables the booting up of your microcontroller on the very first power cycle. Every time you power up your board, the very first thing which comes up is your boot ROM. It's again a piece of software which performs your operation. Then you have device drivers, middleware stack, and application which boots up and performs the required operations. Even if you're preparing your hardware, same thing will happen. You will prepare your hardware in your modules. Module will be integrated to complete the solution, and then you will prepare your hardware design. Hardware design we call schematic and layout. We'll be talking in further slides on that. So nothing ex uh, ex gets excluded. Silicon design, software design, hardware design. Your traceability, what we talked over here. Sorry, uh, the traceability, what we talked over here. They, they all will have requirements. They all will have architecture, detailed design, and they're testing for system integration and unit. So this V curve is applicable to all kind of development for modules and solutions. So let's come to the thing microprocessor versus microcontroller. Multiple theories, multiple answers, what these actually are, how do we differentiate? Microprocessor, it's a processing unit only. It is optimized for performance. Clock frequency of these processors is pretty high in the order of gigahertz. High power consumption. And they use their external bus interfaces for their memory interaction. They don't have their inbuilt memories or peripherals. They have external buses for that. So if you see, you have a microprocessor, then you have external interfaces for a system bus to talk to your memory. It could be a read-only memory, read-write memory. So different communication interfaces like USB, serial port, CAN, LIN, your timer interfaces to perform the timing uh, jobs, your input-output ports. Everything is outside your microprocessor, not inside your chip. On the other hand, if you talk about microcontroller, they have their on-chip input-output, they have their peripherals on the same silicon, they have the memory on the same silicon. These are optimized for cost kind of ASICs or SOCs. Microcontroller is an elementary for that. The clock frequency is, not, is in uh, order of megahertz. They have a lower power consumption. They have their internal controlling bus. So if you see, whatever was connected on a bus lies in a single entity, your core or your processor, your memories, read and write, your timers, IO ports, and communication interfaces together, single entity 
it becomes your microcontroller. Now let's look into few steps for defining an embedded system. Now this is a layered architecture, how your uh, software hardware comes together for your embedded system. On the bottom you see it's an embedded hardware. Now this is a piece of a hardware where you, you have your different ICs and your peripherals and power control logic. So your microcontroller or microprocessor will be there. Your memories. Hello. Your peripheral. Hello. Anybody saying something? Okay. So you have memories, your peripherals, and your power control logic together on a single hardware. It becomes your embedded hardware. Then you build a software which will be deployed on this processor and will do the job. Now there will be device drivers. There will be an operating system like an RTOS, what we talked about. There will be different middleware stacks. Now middleware stacks are your kind of your application oriented libraries, which will do a specific operation for you. I'll take an example, the TLS communication we have today. There is an open source library called Embed TLS, which gives you an uh, crypto operations and a TLS layer interfacing. That, that could be an example of your middleware stack. And then you have your end application, which is sitting on the top, which will be executing the workflow, which you want your embedded uh, hardware to perform. So all this uh, embedded software and hardware layers together prepare your embedded solution or embedded system. Now, if we have to look into actual steps of defining it, I divide it into two parts. We prepare for making an embedded system and then we execute. When, when we say we are preparing, we are preparing a solution. We are preparing a block diagram. Block diagram on a paper. Then we define the behavior based submodules. We will prepare a control block. We will prepare an input control block or a power control block, network interfaces. All this we prepare on a paper as a block diagram. We do the power budgeting of our solution. Looking to the area where we for which we are building this embedded for handheld devices which are running by a battery or mains power devices which are running on a power supply externally. So we have to define which all components or module should be consuming what kind of power. This is called as power budgeting. We define it. We define a form factor. We do this analysis. The form factor means how the look and feel of your end product will look like. You want to hold it in a hand. You want to deploy it on the wall. You want to put it in your fall ceiling. All this will come as an input as part of your requirements. And based on that, you will define how big your board will look like. Will it be circular? rectangular, triangular, all those uh, decisions will come as part of your form factor analysis. And then in the end, we will identify our components based on the uh, behavior of the devices we want to achieve. What, which controller you want to choose, whether you want to use a high-end controller or you want to use a low-end controller, low power consuming controllers, what kind of digital sensors you want to use, whether it is a temperature sensor, humidity sensor, motion sensor, depending on your end application what kind of analog devices or interfaces you want to choose. These, this is a selection of your silicons. Once you are ready with this, you go to the execution part of it, preparing it. Now, as we saw, preparing is happening on a hardware and a software level. We are executing for hardware and software. So we execute on hardware. We prepare a schematic diagram for the design. Whatever was available over here in a block diagram gets converted into a a schematic, a connection diagram of different components with an electrical connection, uh, signal connection defined. Different tools are available in the market like Eagle or CAD through which you can prepare your schematic diagram of your end solution with your uh, ICs captured over there. Once you have prepared your schematic, you also try to confirm that this particular uh, circuitry, what you have defined in your schematic will actually function. In order to do that, you have different simulation tool like PSPICE. I believe in your college, you must be using it. You can just do a block diagram connection on your this, uh, simulation tools and see the output signal in a simulated waveform, which will give you a confidence that whatever design you are making on your schematic will function as required with required input, producing a required output. Once you confirm your, your circuitry design looks okay, 
you go and prepare a layout layout uh, is actually you are taking your schematic and then you are putting a traces connections between different components for your end board you prepare there are different uh, schematic and layout tools available you can use orcad also regal also for preparing your layouts after that you prepare your printed circuit board generally you must have seen a red or a green color board it's a bare board with all your footprints for different devices and different traces when i say traces these are connections between your different terminals and different devices on the uh, on your board so that becomes your printed circuit board then you perform an electrical connectivity check before you use this pcb you do a performance or you do a check whether everything what you have defined in your layout is actually deployed correctly there is no shorting anywhere there is no power shorting anywhere so that when you apply a power nothing goes off may make sure all your tracks are connected there is no disconnect before mounting anything sorry once you have your uh, electrical connectivity check on your pcb you do the population of your pcb that is you are putting all your components which you have identified over here and for which you have prepared your schematic on your pcb this is called as soldering of your components on your pcb you are making your uh, uh, connection connection and population on your board and once you populate you don't power it on immediately again you perform an electrical check because it might happen when you are putting a solder it might have created some shorting during time of soldering and if you apply a power immediately there could be a fuse if it is there a blown off or it might catch fire so you make a performance check uh, so a connectivity check to make sure no power pins or uh, connection pins are shorted one everything is okay your hardware is good to go you can power it on but it will not perform anything because it's a stand alone hardware now you will be doing a software development you will be writing your uh, software for the desired application and then you will be debugging this uh, particular software application with your uh, board which you have developed on the top you will make your application you will attach your debuggers and then you will debug your application we'll talk more about how these connections are done so we have seen we have prepared our pcb we have prepared our board and we are developing a software what is the software now now in order to make your embedded board perform the intended task we have to write an embedded software which is generally called as a firmware for the microcontrollers embedded software or firmware we can use it together firmware for microcontroller is generally written in c or c++ language even at times we use assembly language where we have a timing uh, critical uh, behaviors there are multiple ides integrated development environment which are available where we can actually do the development of our firmware or our code few examples of ides are design studio which is coming from nxp we have an eclipse open source ide we have ir workbench we have visual studio these are the areas where you can do the development of your code one and you can also uh, write your code in c c++ whatever language you are choosing and then try to prepare an output of it how to prepare a output of your code we'll talk about it so microcontroller as we know is a digital device it understands one and zero only nothing else and the coding what we do is not in zero and one it is pretty a cumbersome job we don't do it that way so this is where we get compilers into the picture so compilers is a program that translates your human readable code what you are writing in c c++ into computer executable machine codes it is only a program it cannot fix any issues in your code it can tell you your code is not written correctly the mistakes which are identified by the compiler are supposed to be fixed by the developers themselves once your code is written with right syntax to uh, correctly your code will compile compiler will not tell you it will execute the things you are wanting to execute as it is or not that will be ensured by the developer when they are doing a debugging it will just tell you whether your code you have written is can be converted into an executable format which your microcontroller can accept different steps of compiler are pre processing so before preparing your code base or executable of your binary uh, your c code they do the pre analysis of your code for the pre processors 
like your macros, hash defines, hash include of the files. This is handled before even it starts compiling. Then second step is compiling, where it converts the C code into a machine code, which could be uh, deployed. It Then it will be uh, generating an output, which are the objects files. For every C file, there will be a compiler ob output and object file generated. These object files are linked together to by a linker, which is another so uh, software block to convert and give you an executable program which you can deploy on your microcontroller. So the output generally what we see after our compilation and linking is dot binary or dot ELF executable linkable format. These are the most common terms used in terms of output which we deploy on a microcontroller. So if you see on the right hand side, we have an ID where we do the development. I have taken an example of uh, S32 Design Studio. You will be creating your project. You will be writing different C files over here. Then this C files will go to the compiler. It, there could be different compilers. GCC is one of the compiler. GHS is another compiler. Your uh, Diab is another compiler. There are multiple compilers available. IR itself has a compiler. All your source file will go to a compiler. Compiler will generate your object files. All your object files and your external libraries, if any, will be given to a linker. A linker will convert it and bind it together, will give you an executable program, which you can deploy using a debugger on a microcontroller. So IDE, do the development. In IDEs, you can also compile it, or you can compile it separately in a different make environments. You get an executable program or a binary file. Then comes a picture of a, a debugger. You can connect your debugger with your hardware and deploy your executable on your debugger. You can even debug your application on you with a via debugger. Debuggers could be your J-Link. You must have seen coming from uh, uh, J, uh, coming from IR or Segar. It could be uh, the, what you call different vendors provided uh, dedicated debuggers also. NXP also provide different kind of debuggers for your design studio interfaces. Different vendors provide different kind of debuggers for their microcontrollers also. There are many in the market which can be used. Plotter bag is the one which we generally use also with different kind of uh, in integration IDs. Now let's look into quickly on few embedded application design references. We have seen how to define and design an embedded application. So as we said, I'm taking an example of a smartwatch. For example, if somebody thought about making a smartwatch, how will they start? They will look about the form factor. Watch, you have to put it in your wrist. It should be compact. Usability, use, it's a smartwatch. We, we are calling it a smart, so it will be rich user experience. Offer as many user experience features which you, customer can use. Power, because it's a battery power device, low power consumption should be the requirement of this particular uh, embedded uh, solution. Performance efficiency, it, it is showing you a time. You cannot see a lag over there. If it is a touch watch, touch should be real, real time. It should not happen. You touch it, it takes five seconds before it responds. That becomes the performance efficiency. These comes as an input, what we have seen in the past. Once we take this, we prepare a block diagram. Now you see how we prepare a block diagram. We have taken a microcontroller. We see, we understood in order to do this, we need a microcontroller. We are taking a voice input. We are taking an audio codec block. There will be a power management block for managing the power of this complete solution. If you are uh, enabling a wireless communication, Bluetooth connectivity to the watch, we will give a wireless co communication interface or a NFC near field communication. If you are looking for a contactless uh, communication, there will be few sensors coming as an input, ambient line sensor in order to dim your watch or make it bright. There will be user buttons. There will be a display as an output. Input output like a micro USB where you can insert, uh, do the charging of your char, uh, smartwatch or can expand the memory if you want to store some data. And then the external storage interfaces. So this is on a higher level, you prepare a block diagram without even identifying what part numbers or what silicon you want to choose. With block diagram, you understood the functionality can be achieved. Then you go and look for a required microcontroller you want, required power management depending on the 
the battery life you want to provide to the uh, solution, what kind of wireless communication, what kind of Bluetooth chip you want to use over here. Then you go and look for those part numbers and then next level you prepare a schematic out of it. Then you prepare a layout, you get this form factor of your hardware and then you do debug of an application. I have added a link for an NXP site where you can find the detail of this particular uh, solution. Another I am talking about a contactless reader now. It's a smaller module. So NXP NFC readers are there uh, in the market. It, uh, NXP is a world leader in NFC. We prepare a wireless reader, so it's a very small solution. If you see, it's just a reader. We have a small MCU which interfaces with your uh, ECDC uh, power supply unit, which is a power control module. Then we have an inputs with your NFC tags. You should have an NFC uh, front end where this tags can be uh, attached and uh, data can be exchanged. This data will go as on a digital input or digital uh, interface, which is I2C to your controller. And then we have a RTC real time clock for clocking information, timing information to the solution. So these are the peripherals. If you see I2C is a peripheral digital interface. This is the second level of block diagram where we have also identified. OK, what kind of digital communication interfaces we want between different chips in our solution? This will help us in identifying the right component and then preparing a schematic. Now you see this is just a reader. This reader will be used in another embedded solution, which will be a point of sales POS. So you must have remembered in the initial phase we talked about one embedded system can be a smaller module for a bigger embedded system. This is an example of that. This is just a reader which will go to the POS machine as an input. Now this is a bigger embedded solution, which is a POS machine point of sale. This is nothing but a power battery power terminal where you swipe your card or tap your card for the transactions in market. This is what we call as point of sale machine. This is having your contactless reader as one input and then multiple other sub blocks like your Bluetooth, Wi-Fi interfaces, G GPRS or cellular interfaces, your thermal printer for printing outputs, your push buttons or your touch displays and your contactless readers. This together again prepare your end product or solution. So this was an example. Your smaller subsystem goes to bigger subsystem to give you another embedded solution. And this is another 15 volt wireless charging is very much available in the market today. You get your mobile phones, you put it, tap it on your wireless charger and get charged. So this is a high level uh, block diagram. How will you start with that idea? You prepare a block diagram, you identify your components, then go to the schematic part and then you prepare your hardware based on that. And then uh, a bigger system. As we were talking about car, right? So today's car have more than 100 ECUs. Now what is an ECU? ECU is an electronic control unit. It's a small embedded subsystem in a vehicle that performs a specific operation in your car. There are more than 100 ECUs in your car, which will be controlling different different areas of your car. Example, there will be an ECU doing the engine and power steering control. There will be a dedicated ECU which is controlling your power windows up and down and monitoring it. The ECUs to control your seats where you have your digital and uh, electronic seats, your HVAC, your heating and ventilation system in your uh, car, your infotainment, your music system, your door locking. Everything you see is actually an, a small ECU or subsystem a small embedded solution that together is connected together to produce to build your car which is electronically controlled now this is giving an example okay one embedded system can be connected together to build a bigger one bigger one and the biggest one so now we'll try to summarize embedded system all around you wherever you see you will find a uh, embedded system Design is modular. Always think about a smallest module and about the integration of that module to prepare an end solution. Security and safety are becoming an integrated part because everything is becoming digital. It can be hacked. So you, when you are defining and designing your system, you have to make sure you're choosing a right component, right kind of security to save your embedded solution from attacks from outside world. It should be safe. 
you are holding an embedded system in your hand, it should not blow up. It should not blow up. It should not burn. That is requirement. So accordingly, you will choose depending on the power consumption, depending on the behavior of your solution. You choose your uh, semiconductors. You choose your design. You choose your hardware traces so that it is able to sustain all kind of adverse scenarios and environments where it can be used. So safety and security comes as integrated part of your design. So that's all from my end. We can take any questions or we can go back to any slide where you want me to go.